looking back on the past four years, there's been some ups and downs, there's been some bad days, there's been some good days, and that's fine because that's normal. And I, I saw a presentation recently and literally someone said, your public health journey looks like this. Just like, just like two chords, just like all jumbled together. And it's not this linear, beautiful path of like success or not success or like up and down. It's all over the place. You could have some successful days. You could have some good days. You can have some bad days. You can have some days where you're really feeling it. You can have some days that you're not. But I say all of that to say, listen, that's the beautiful thing of public health. And my position now has really opened a lot of doors for me. And it, it really has, it, having the doctorate has really helped me to be a leader in this field. And without it, I don't know that I would have had the same opportunities. And specifically in the federal government, a lot of people have a PhD or an MD and not a DRPH. So being a drph -er makes you unique, almost like a unicorn, if you will. And it's a beautiful thing because I'm trailblazing in my own way. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hi friends, welcome to the 150th episode of Public Health Careers. Thank you so much for rocking with me and the show over the last few years. I greatly appreciate you all and look forward to sharing even more stories to highlight various careers in public health while equipping you with the knowledge, skills, and breaking of limiting beliefs to get you to the next stage of your public health career. And with all that, I say thank you and be sure to subscribe. Also, happy graduation to all the graduates out there. You made it this far and this is just the beginning. If no one has told you, here it is. You are amazing and will do impactful work. We appreciate you and we look forward to all your impact in the work that you're going to do. In today's episode, you'll learn more about the work being done to end the HIV epidemic in the US, applying the framework of being a free thinking woman as taught by her HBCU, as well as maximizing all efforts, networks and opportunities in your career growth. Be sure to hit the subscribe button, be sure to leave a review, hopefully a five star review and share it with someone who get value from it 150 episodes and I couldn't get here without all of you. So thank you once again. And if you'd like to support, there's a link below to support in other ways. Enjoy. Hey, this is Dr. Marissa Robinson and I am the Ending the HIV Epidemic in the HIV in US coordinator. And you are listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have a highly motivated international public health innovator currently working passionately on ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S. initiative within the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV and AIDS Policy. She conferred a Bachelor's of Psychology at Spelman College and worked for a few years before getting her Master of Public Health at Emory University and then a Doctor of Public Health and Epidemiology at Morgan State. She currently works as an Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative Coordinator at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and also works or has worked as a Zumba instructor for four years. We have Dr. Marissa Robinson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure. I'm really, really excited for this interview. I've been, I feel like we've been uh, email tagging for a little bit, but it's always good when we get, get you on the show. Absolutely. And happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> I, I, literally, I literally forgot it was Cinco de Mayo, <laughs> but happy Cinco de Mayo to yes. everyone out there. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, so how do you identify and how are you doing? Yes. So my pronouns are she and her and I'm doing wonderful. It's Friday. I love Fridays because it's right before the weekend. So I was super excited to have the opportunity to come and speak with you today and talk about public health and how, you know, we can talk about my experience and, and help others that may be interested in public health or might be interested in learning more about infectious disease, HIV, or even just being a black woman trying to occupy spaces and break ceilings. Yes, we need we need more black people and black women to occupy spaces and uh, break ceiling. So I, yes. I would, like before we get into anything, like talk talk more about that. Absolutely. So, you know, there are 
several women that have trailblazed in the field of public health. And really, when you look at anything in life, you can relate it back to public health. So nothing in this world is not related to public health. And that's the beautiful thing about our discipline. But at the same time, there have been a lot of glass ceilings, a lot of barriers that not only uh, ethnic minorities have had to break, but also gender and sexual minorities have had to break. And so I really pride myself of occupying spaces and rooting for everybody Black, as Issa Rae always says. And so I'm always Black proud and always trying to, you know, make people smile um, and also educate people along the way. Great. So you are a uh, ending the HIV epidemic initiative coordinator as at the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. So yes. do you want to just talk more about ending the HIV epidemic and the work that's being done around there? Absolutely. So that is our federal initiative to help lower the prevalence um, or how many individuals are currently living with HIV in the U.S. And the initiative started in 2019. And then shortly thereafter, the initiative started. Uh, also, COVID then came. So there are a lot of targets and goals and indicators that we have at the federal level to kind of help us reach those goals. And so we want to make sure that we have folks getting into care, uh, making sure they remain in care. And we have something in the HIV or infectious disease world with HIV that undetectable equals untransmittable, which basically means if you have lower rates, uh, lower lower viral load count of HIV in your blood, you actually cannot physically transmit the virus to someone else. And so we really love that message because it lets folks that are living with HIV know that they can thrive with HIV and that if they are medically adherent, they do not put their partners or their loved ones at risk. And so this initiative really brings community into the uh, a conversation, but also talks about how we can work together and making sure it's a whole of society initiative. And when I say that, it means that it's going to take not only conversations like these on podcasts, but also conversations at the federal, local, and state level to help community partners, pri pri private public partnerships, as well as those in the federal and local governments to be able to come together and have conversations about how can we help those in the community that are living with HIV, but also those that are not living with HIV and may be at risk for acquiring HIV and making sure that everybody has the education, the resources, and the knowledge to be able to make informed decisions. That's a great holistic approach. And I know that you also started in 2019, but I'll ask you this question later on, <laughs> later on when we get into like your path to get into the position that you're in right now. Yes. So, you are or were a Zumba instructor for the last four years uh, yes. on your LinkedIn. I think it says you're currently, you're presently a Zumba mm -hmm. instructor. Yes. And this is where you like, you have a love for people, health, wellness, and dance and all that intersects. Do you want to talk about how you got involved into Zumba and like how important that is to you in your life and your wellness? Absolutely. So I have always been a dancer. I started dancing when I was probably around like five years old. And so I always have had some sort of dance or cheerleading going on in my life. And so as I got older, I started to go to the gym, learn about weightlifting and weight training. And as I started to get older and go into high school, and then when I was in high school, I also worked at a um, gym. And so at the gym, I worked as a daycare provider at the gym, but I would always go and work out. And one of the my favorite classes was Zumba. And so it really combined the strength and conditioning, but also with music. And so when you're like dying of doing a high interval intensity training class, and you're constantly thinking about, oh my gosh, this has nothing to do with the music that's playing. It, it, it's a totally different workout. But when you're twerking and you're also doing some crunches and some squats in the middle, it really just combines it all together. And it truly, the Zumba community spreads, spreads internationally. And then it also sheds light on all the love of music, as well as all different cultures and ethnic groups and all different styles of dance. So I just always knew that that was something that I love to do. And so moving forward, as I got 
through my master's program, it actually helped me to kind of balance work and school was this outlet to be able to have physical fitness. And so as I was doing Zumba, a lot of people would be like, you need to be a Zumba instructor. Like, you're so good. Like you lead classes, you can lead us in stretching. And I was like, you know what? I'm actually going to go get certified. So I've been certified for the past four years and I've been teaching online. And I also just started teaching kickboxing and strength and conditioning. So it really is a great outlet. And I highly encourage folks that are maybe struggling with balancing, you know, health and wellness to really consider doing some group fitness, whether that's aerobics, whether that's Zumba, whether that's body pump, there are all different types of workouts. And YouTube is a great place to explore that. And in the pandemic, I think a lot of people actually look to YouTube to continue staying fit and trying to stay in shape because gyms, unfortunately, were closed for a, a long period of time in 2020. And so they've slowly, you know, Obviously, everything is opened back up now in 2023, but I think it is important to kind of see what resources you have at home, because if the barrier is, oh, I don't have a membership, or oh, I'm not going to pay for those classes, or I'm not going to, whatever the barrier is, child, there's YouTube for that. So I always encourage folks, like if you love dance, you love music, and you just want to move your body, because you don't have to be certified to just love Zumba. You can just learn the steps on your own. But as long as you're getting your heart rate up and you're staying active, that's a part of the, you know, the goal. And especially Black women, cardiovascular, heart disease, a lot of disparities impact Black communities specifically, but even more so Black women. So making sure I'm talking to my uh, brothers and sisters about getting out there and doing physical fitness is one of my passions, as well as public health. So yeah. I love that intersection and I love the framing of thinking about it as an outlet to balance work, life, school and everything in between, because I think so many times we do get caught up in our head. And I know I have a, a few friends who were really struggling with with like not having a, an outlet or a fitness outlet, especially during the mm -hmm. pandemic, because they enjoyed those group type of classes. So I definitely right. recommend that people are able to do that. And and to your point, there are just so, so many low levels uh, low barrier levels here because you could as you said there's youtube where you can find an endless amount of content and then like even in myself me and my partner well she hosts uh yoga sessions at two yeah. times two times a week and mm -hmm. it's just literally pulling up a, a black yogi on on a youtube sharing a screen exactly. and then we come together as a group and we practice yoga so I, I, I love that and i think it is something that we continue continually need to talk about especially in the black community so i appreciate you absolutely lifting that up. so mm -hmm. what does public health mean to you so public health really is everything and anything that you can think of. And when I think of my impact in the public health field, I feel like there has been so many people that have come before me. And there's so many people that are still here that are inspirations to me, which is why I still continue to do this work. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get into public health because it's a glamorous life and it's well paid. We really do this work because we love the communities that we serve. And it's really a selfless field to go into because you really want to affect change for populations, breaking down systems, breaking down barriers. And some Sometimes the changes that we, you know, you and I may be trying to institute might, we not, might not see the fruits of our labors in our lifetime. But the beautiful thing about it is that we are starting to blaze our own trails for those that come after us to be able to have it easier. And that is what keeps me motivated, especially working with college students and young people. It really is inspiring to see our young people have environmental justice movements and be speaking out on sexual and reproductive justice and just really taking advocacy, policy changes and using their voices to be heard and be taken seriously. And the beautiful thing about social media is that a message that was just going to get to a smaller group of people that are there at an event or in person is now you know broadcasted worldwide so that's one of the beautiful things of public health and what it kind of means to me yeah i appreciate that and before we get more into your public health journey and your undergrad collegiate journey because you got your bachelor's of psychology with a public health concentration at spelman college 
But during high school, you were definitely a go-getter. You had a couple of positions that I just wanted to highlight. I wanted you to speak about. So you were a student ambassador for the People to People Ambassadors Program. You were a research intern at the Institute of Human Virology, University of Maryland School of Medicine. And you were also a student leader of the Appalachian Service Project. So do you want to talk a little bit about those as well as tell us where, what geographical region did you go to school in? Yes. So first and foremost, you brought up people to people. So that was actually in middle school. I was in sixth <laughs> grade um, and I also have a twin brother. So me and my twin got the chance to go to England, Ireland and Wales in sixth grade. We thought we were just the bee's knees, honey. And we got to travel to those three countries. But it was beautiful to experience culture and travel at such a young age. And it really helped to for me to appreciate different cultures, different foods, different lifestyles, as well as learning about history and just the the love that I have for people and traveling and experiencing different things at a young age. And so that kind of led me into this like development, like wanting to travel more and be global. And when I got to high school and did the internship at the Institute of Human Virology, that's really when I started my HIV work. Uh, I actually worked with a professor known as Dr. Lydia Temeshok. She's a world-renowned science, uh, psychiatrist and researcher. And she was looking at, uh, looking at persons who lived with full-blown AIDS which is basically HIV stage three. Uh, so you haven't been on medication. You've had basically no medical intervention and uh, have a terminal diagnosis. And so most of the patients she was looking at, if they had lower stress levels, would they be able to live longer? And the data show that if they had lower stress levels, so if they had stable housing, if they had a place to uh, go to work or employment, if they had, uh, you know, family support, psych mental health services, transportation, all of these components, they had lower stress levels. So then they lived longer and their uh, ch uh, chemokines, which is what the study looked at, were actually lower which made them live longer and more prosperous. And that really piqued my interest because I started to look at the demographics of the data and I was like, why are all these people black? And then come to find out it was a, you know, the study population was looking at folks living in Baltimore city at the time. And I was just so shocked because I had never learned, I might've learned about it in sex ed and maybe sixth grade, but I was not paying attention or maybe it was ninth grade, but I wasn't paying attention to be honest. And so learning about that in high school really shocked me and catapulted me into the medical field. So then fast forwarding even further into the next experience of also serving in the Appalachian Service Project, that was like a Habitat for Humanity program through my local church. And it was a great week-long trip that we would do, and we would go to different regions within West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, Virginia, all along the Appalachian region. And we would basically build homes um, and serve the underserved. And I, I just look, when I looked at my CV as we got ready to prepare for this interview, I really saw the threads of like, a humanitarian and wanting to help others and being selfless and working in development and grassroots approaches. And it really kind of framed why I even wanted to go into public health and uh, psychology at Spelman. Now, truth be told, I did start out as a chemistry major at Spelman and that did not really pan out well for me because I was a social butterfly. I'm also <laughs> Greek. I'm in the uh, uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And so that kind of took hold of what I wanted to do. And so the social butterfly in me was like, I want to do every and everything. And chemistry was just not my ministry. So I think it worked out though, because I still ended up being successful and I still love what I do. And so for most of my uh, training, in public health started in Atlanta, Georgia, and then kind of ended up here in the DMV area in Baltimore and then in DC. So kind of been up and down the East Coast, but also have done some international work. And I'll get more into that as we go through my, you know, experiences. Yeah, I appreciate that. You you got your You've gotten this experience as a middle schooler, which I think is awesome. And I think like more people should 
I advocate for it like a lot because I'm from Trinidad. My dad is a pilot, mm -hmm. so I've been very privileged in that sense that I've been able to travel a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the industry has changed a lot. I used to be able to like sit co-pilot with him uh, next to wow. either, next to either him in the cockpit or like with the uh, flight attendants in the back. Uh, what the, the booster seat? Yeah, booster seat. That's what oh, they yeah, call it. Seat. But mm -hmm. but uh, the industry changed a lot, and ju just to say that, I think that being able to travel and to your point, like just experience different cultures and see people live different ways, eat different foods is so mm -hmm. impactful. And it can really just get your mind thinking about, oh, there are so many different opportunities out here to work in different ways to improve health and wellness. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're able to, to get that experience. And I think it, it probably informed a lot of what you did to that point. And I also love the point of you saying like looking back on it, because I think too many times, as professionals, as even as students, we are doing so many things and we are, we yeah. are like looking forward. We never take time to really look back and reflect on where we came from and like what are those kind of like pivotal decisions and ideas that came up throughout our journey to make us become the person that we are right now. So I'm always happy when someone is able, is able to say, oh, like this, this has maybe like reflect on that part of my life and really understand where I am now. Okay, so you started as a bachelor's in chemistry at Spelman mm -hmm. College. Talk mm -hmm. us through the thought process of that and then the switch to psychology and, and when did public health come up for you? Absolutely. So <clears throat> in high school, I was really good at chemistry and my professor at the time or my teacher at the time was super inspirational. And she was like, you're so good at chemistry. Like you could be a, uh, go into the medical fields. Like you should definitely be a doctor or something. And so I was like, okay, like I could do that. I hated math though. So there was just a disconnect there because had she been honest with me, I could have just saved myself and maybe looked into biology or looked into public health from the beginning. But so when I went to Spelman, I started all the chemistry courses and high school level chemistry and college level <laughs> chemistry is a whole different ball game. Cause not only that, but you have lab that's attached to all of your core sciences. And then on top of that at Spelman, there was something called the gate system. So our chair in the chemistry department, she had this system where if you did not get anything higher than a B, you failed. Wow. So even if you got like a high C, you're out of there. Wow. So you automatically failed and you only had, I think, one or two times to like pass in order to uh, pass for the next, you know, set of exams. So that system didn't really work out for me. Um, so I was like, you know what? Uh, after my freshman year, uh, freshman year, first semester, I said, all right, we need to go to the career development office. We need to have some conversations. Let's go, let's go to the you know chair's office and see what options I had. And so at that point, I pivoted from uh, chemistry to public health, I mean, uh, psychology. And so when I was going through the psychology courses, I also had the opportunity to take some courses over at Morehouse College, which was across the street and in Atlanta, in the AUC or the Atlanta University Center, we have several different consortiums and it's like one of the largest consortiums of five HBCUs. So we have Morehouse School of Medicine, Morehouse College, Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, and then we also have Morris Brown College. And we also have the ITC, which is like an interdenominational uh, seminary school. So it's like all of those schools are right within the same corridor. And it's it was a great place to go to college because you could take, you could cross register and take different courses. And so as I was thinking about public health, I also double minored in psych uh, psychology was my major. And then I did both um, public health and environmental health because I was really big in environmental justice when I was in college and EPA was like the dream job. And then I was like, Ooh, maybe not. And, uh, I, I went through so many different paths of like, I want to go into medicine. No, I want to go into environmental justice. No. And then I kind of landed on public health because it kind of did a little bit of everything. And then with psychology, I love talking to people. I love talking. I love trying to get into people's heads or like help folks get through things. And so that kind of mother nurturing 
entity of myself helped me to realize that psychology was probably the best for me. And then with the social science piece, it still kind of helped me to be able to cross register and do that flexibility that I necessarily wouldn't have been able to do if I was in uh, the chemistry department. Now, the other pivot I could have did was biology because then I could have still, you know, taken those prereqs to be able to qualify to go to med school. But at the time, it just wasn't in the cards. And ultimately, I think the path that I chose was probably the best path for me. It absolutely is, because you are here today, able to tell your story and be happy yes. about it, which I think is a success. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just want to like highlight the point of like, during your journey, there were so many different ideas of like what that success would be, whether that was being a physician, whether that was mm -hmm. working at the EPA. But I think like the through line there is, okay, we want to help people. We want to help people how, yes. how how can we help people and i think like just having that direction is, is so much more important than having like a solid idea of what's just one organization or one position that i want to work, work for right so, yeah so i just want to highlight that okay yes and and when when did you hear about public health to be able to take like a public health minor so one of the professors that was teaching at Spellman, she was in the U United States Public Health Commission Corps, and they are our fifth uniform service members that serve and get deployed for public health emergencies. Obviously, with COVID, there have been several outbreaks, and they were involved in a lot of different COVID uh, initiatives, and then also like with Ebola and several other public health emergencies that we've had, the Commission Corps has been there. And a lot of people will confuse them with like the Army or other uniformed service members, but they are a, a great uniform body. And a lot of my coworkers and nearest and dearest are our service members. So I want to thank them and shout them out for their service. But one of my professors was in the Commission Corps and she was the professor in the psychology department. And one of the courses I took my sophomore year was um, HIV and African Americans. And it was through the Department of Psychology. And some of the opportunities we got to do was go and intern somewhere downtown uh, with nonprofit organizations that were for persons living with HIV at the time. And it was that professor that told me, you know, you should really look into public health. Because if you're interested in HIV and you're interested in this work, this could be a, a avenue that you should explore further. And so it was my junior, uh, my sophomore year that I started taking environmental toxicology and environmental health and some of those other core courses that really catapulted me into the world of public health and my epidemiology, my biostats, all of those courses are things that then followed. But that's kind of how I got started with from the academic side. But I think the theme of everything was like, how can I still be in medicine, but like not be in medicine? How can I be medicine adjacent? And then once we figured that out, it all kind of, you know, meshed well. <laughs> that make, makes sense. And like, to, to your point earlier, it also um, allows you to do all those things like environmental health, public health, HIV, right. it, all, it all falls on, under the bigger bucket of public health, which I think is important for people to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. And during your undergrad, you had a lot of positions. I'm not going to name them. I'll link your LinkedIn <laughs> profile. <laughs> Loads of people can check those out or they can reach out to you and you can have that deeper conversation with them. But I, I would love for you to like highlight maybe a couple of those positions that were key for you in your journey or uh, maybe pivotal in you just understanding like who you wanted to be or what you wanted to pursue. Absolutely. So, yes, I did have a lot of different positions. And I think that in itself really encouraged me very early on in my academic career that I can balance multiple things at one time. And that's important in public health because many of us have wear many different hats, you're doing many different projects. And so it really instituted that importance of time management, making sure that I was on top of my studies and also wanting to pledge making that commitment in college that requires a whole different set of priorities and making sure you still get good grades, especially at Spelman, the minimum GPA was a 3.0. So there really was no messing around if you wanted to pledge at Spelman. And, and, and even being at Spelman, I think really 
open my eyes to the diversity within my own race. And then also just all the different cultures that are the melting pot in the U.S. and how so many people aspire and dream to come to Spelman and just the opportunity to be there, but also have this sisterhood just being at Spelman, but then also trying to uplift Black women to a higher standard is is just a beautiful concept. And one of our quotes for the school is, I am a free thinking woman. And that's like one of the models of our school. And so taking that throughout my matriculation was also important. So it helped me not just put myself in, oh, I have to be a chemistry major and that's it. It also helped me to expand my knowledge of, yeah, public health is for me because I love people. I love working not only on the individual level, but also at population level, and then impacting a population versus just patient to patient care. Although that is very necessary and near and dear to, especially the field of infectious disease, it it, it really kind of catapulted me into, okay, this is where I see myself going. Spellman is going to build me up, help me to think about how I carry myself, how to speak properly, how to engage different communities, how to be an educator, how to be a trendsetter, trailblazer, if you will, but also uplifting our community, specifically the Black community. Um, And so my t-shirt says HBCU Educated Doctor. I don't know if you can see. So I always love wearing this t-shirt every time I speak to either HBCU students or when I'm just talking openly about my experience and going to a HBCU is an experience within itself. And if you ever have the opportunity to, I always recommend that students experience what it's like to go to a HBCU because you can always tell when you get out in the real world after college, who went to a HBCU and who did not. Um, <laughs> and they, it just is a different, uh, the way you carry yourself, the way you articulate, it's just, it's, it, it's just different. And it's a beautiful thing. And throughout my uh, time at Spelman, there were so many different experiences that I that I had on campus and off. And some of the independent research programs that I did really helped me to realize, okay, research is where I can make a difference. And then doing public health helped me to be able to do all sorts of different types of research. Um, I worked in breast cancer research. I worked in like black women and self-esteem. I also worked on a study that worked with Morehouse School of Medicine and looked at day reporting centers for folks that were recently released from incarceration. So I was all over the place in different research, but I think again, the, the fine line that went through all of those experiences is helping others, helping those of my community and then being passionate about something greater than myself and leading with culture humility. Love that, love that. And I, I think that's important. And you definitely are able to tell most of the time people that do come from HBCUs. I, I will I will admit that. I will admit that. They do they do show up in a certain way. You know, we, we, we really do. We really do. We really take up space. Right, right, right. And it, but know, in a good way. Yes, absolutely. In a way that is necessary and needed, especially to impact the issues that we try to work with in public health. So I appreciate that. Yes. And yeah, definitely more the more i because I'm, I'm not from the u.s so like i didn't know much about hbcus but like reflecting mm-hmm. i wish i did go to hbcu maybe i, I will. wish you did too <laughs> maybe, maybe i will go maybe to hbcu will. in the future exactly like there who we knows? go who uh-huh. knows? <laughs> yeah so so after undergrad your first position was as a research assistant at john hopkins school of medicine do you know talk a little yes. bit about how you got that first position and then what did you do in that position Yes. So, um, so graduating from Spelman, I was on a cloud. I was like, oh my gosh, all these people are going to be knocking down my door. I just went to the number one HBCU. Like nobody can tell me anything. And it was just like a harsh, a harsh waking, awakening of sis. No, (laughs) you have limited experience because you've only had internships, you know, throughout college. But even for a lot of first 
uh, entry level positions, they still want you to have some experience before you can get their experience. So it was like a lot of still barriers of like, oh, well, you you did this, but you still need to do more. And also I had studied for the GRE. I didn't do the, all that well. And so all the schools I applied to, because I wanted to go into an MPH program like right after Spelman. And they were like, oh, you need job experience. I was like, what? is this like everyone's saying you need more experience but you have some experience but just not enough so luckily i had uh you know did some interviewing throughout you know my my senior year of okay i'm gonna reach out to some folks back home because i probably more likely than not if i wasn't going to get into grad school i was going to you know move back to maryland so ultimately talked to some folks in my networks and I was able to connect with one of my mentors and she was like, yeah, I have a research project that you could come and work on. And so that was with the Center for Eliminating Health Disparities, Cardiovascular Health Disparities at uh, Johns Hopkins. And it was in East Baltimore uh, working with uh, cardiovascular folks and doing blood pressure screenings and doing patient education and going to marketplaces and giving, you know, little mini symposiums about what you can do with your diet and how you should stay away from sugars and salts and all these different things. Because in the Black community, we are disproportionately impacted by what? Cardiovascular disease, heart disease, diabetes, you name it, we got it. And so really helping folks to understand you can take control of your diabetes, you can reverse cardiovascular disease, you can do a lot with diet and exercise changes. So that was one of the first ways that I was able to really see public health in action and not just the research side. I got to see the community side and some of that implementation and intervention side. So that really helped me to frame kind of, okay, I can, I can do community work and I can do the research work because not everybody is built for both. You got some people that are like, oh, I'm just in the community. Don't ask me about no research. And then you got folks that are like, really get into the weeds and nerdy. And they're like, research is my jam. This is where I stay. Don't ask me to go to the community. And so I'm like, well, look, I'm here. I can do both. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I think to, to the point there is like, you wanting to get your MPH right after getting those doors kind of shut. Mm -hmm. And 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 then from <laughs> from that you're like leaning on, okay, what can I do now? Where where do I have those connections? And I I, I believe you said you had a mentor and from that mentorship you're able to get this research assistant position, which also was able to help you build up experiences and help you understand that you can work in public health on this axis of like research and, and practitioner. And you're like, I want to do a little bit of both. I want to make, make yes. the intersection of that, which I think is what we need more of. In this first position, were you still under the mindset of, I want to get my MPH or was this like yeah. the building blocks to, to move forward to get an MPH? Yeah. So, so everyone that I worked with either had an MPH or a PhD. And so I was like, I need to get, I can't just continue without a master's, but all of the programs and in, insisted I needed to get job experience. So it was kind of like, okay, I have to do more work in the community and in this field to be able to get into some of these programs. And so it, it ended up happening, you know, a few years later, which is fine because it also helped me to understand, okay, where do I want to go in terms of school? what program is best for me and where can I get the most out of my matriculation at a certain school to put me at a level that is not only competitive enough to be in the field of public health, which is highly competitive, especially with COVID. It just exacerbated right. and blew up the public health field, which is beautiful. And, you know, a lot of people know about epidemiology now, didn't know about it didn't know anything about epidemiology or didn't know anything about how diseases spread or how, you know, diseases mutate or anything like that. So we definitely have done some good things in the public health field in terms of like being in a global pandemic. But at the same time, there is a lot of lessons learned and a lot of things that we still could have done better and still can do better, which is why you and I are here. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And also at this point in time, were you thinking about getting a doctorate or was that something that came later on in your journey? 
Yeah, that came later. Um, but it was at also at the end of of my time at Spelman that there was a career fair and there was a recruiter there by the name of Jean-Paul Pierre. And he was a huge recruiter in the AUC for the Peace Corps. And so he was a Peace Corps rep and he came to multiple events and he would have these awesome pictures of like students that had recently graduated that were in these beautiful countries and got to do community work and grassroots and fundraising and working with kids and working in health systems or in education or in, you know, agricultural settings. And I was like, okay, if this whole school thing don't work out, we have another path that we can take. And so we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> yeah, we, we will get into that now. And, and, and like, before we get into it, like, I, I love that perspective of like, just knowing that there, there isn't just one path that you can take. There are just so many mm -hmm. paths that you can take, especially in public health. And people get too, right. too tight on like, if this one thing didn't happen, then I'm, I'm a failure. But that isn't the case. That's just, that rejection is just redirection. Like to your case, to your point, like those MPH doors being closed early on allows you to get these experiences and then who would have known if you would have been able to get into the Peace Corps like do Peace Corps work if you got into the MPH early on so right it all works out it all works out mm -hmm. just the same it all works out right so you were a CHAMP <laughs> volunteer in the Peace Corps and you were in Togo so CHAMPS is the Community Health and Malaria Prevention Volunteer uh, do you know talk mm -hmm. more about that did you just reach, reach back out to John Bear and and how, how did that work how was that experience for you? Yes. So <laughs> let me tell you, I in no way, shape or form even knew where Togo was. <laughs> and when they called me and said I was accepted, honestly, I think on my application, I might've put Fiji or something like far, far away because I was like, I want to go somewhere tropical and be on the beach and just be out here. No, they were like, um, do you want to go to West Africa? And do you want to leave like immediately? And I was like, okay, well this, if, if, uh, you believe in divine intervention. I was like, okay, this is God's calling. This is what he wants for me to do. And I was like, I, I gotta go. And the funny thing about Togo is they are Francophone. So they speak French. Marissa spoke no French whatsoever. <laughs> and so I was like, this is interesting that you are asking me to go and live in a country for two years uh, with no French experience and still trust me to do that. So I did have to take like several different <laughs> courses and I actually had to do like several weeks of intensive tr language training and they told us to do some French, you know, practice before we left. And I was like, I'm, I'm not doing any practice because why am I, why am I about to ruin my summer before I leave, uh, wasting it on practicing French? So that probably would have been better if I looked back <laughs> on it. But it's okay because the type of person I am, uh, it, it really worked out because even though my French was horrible when I got there, I could still make people laugh. I could still like dancing, you know, is universal. Um, laughter is universal. So some of those pieces of like the technicality of being able to communicate, you can still communicate with people, even if you don't speak their local language or their, uh, you know, uh, language in general, but that was the beauty of me as an individual of, okay, I'm going to go do this program and see what international development is like, see what it's like to live in a remote village, see what it's like to be immersed in a culture. And the beautiful thing about Peace Corps is they do teach you something called the psychology of sitting. And so in the first, basically, couple of months to at least like six to eight months that you're there, you're really supposed to sit and observe. You're not supposed to come in and say, hey, I know everything. And like, let me show you about all the things I know because I'm American and I'm privileged and blah, 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 blah. It was like, okay, let me come and sit and listen and look and watch all of the things you do. And then as I'm getting to know you all, making relationships, understanding where you're coming from and what your day-to-day -day life looks like. Then at that point, and when I'm a trusted member of your you know, community and or a visitor of your community, you then start to make those connections of 
This is what we can do with water and sanitation hygiene. And this is what we can do with community health. And this is what we can do for malaria prevention. And this is what we can do for HIV prevention. And this is what we can do for prenatal and antenatal care. All of these pieces are things that it was, it was a mutually learn, a mutual learning experience and exchange of information. So I was not just coming and spreading my information and knowledge. I was constantly getting, you know, encouraged and, and being impressed upon by the individuals that I was, you know, living amongst. And it really was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done in my life. Um, I actually got medically separated and had to come home. Um, and my journey got cut short and it was really detrimental to me because I really had a soft space in my heart, but it, it, it was, it was a beautiful experience and I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, but there were some things that if I could go back in time and be able to stay for the full, you know, term of my service, I would have, um, but that's just not how, you know, life ended up working out. So, uh, but the experience I had kind of helped me to get the non-competitive eligibility, which helped me to get into the federal government and then continue my work. So again, it was another stepping stone that opened doors for me for international work and being a champion on the global space, but also helped me to really solidify my desire to help others that maybe can't help themselves or don't know how to. Yeah, love that, love that. And I think that that's important, that uh, psychology of sitting. Um, that's something I think more of us need to incorporate into right. our lives. And especially mm -hmm. when we're moving around to just like, to, to the point earlier in the conversation is like, you get to experience new cultures. So it's really it's really not the, get, the best thing to come into a new place and just like blast your culture on top of their culture without understanding how they operate, what is okay, who are the leaders here, how how do we make this communication? Um, but then mm -hmm. I also want to highlight the point of, of you like taking this this trip to a French speaking area and you don't speak French and that is fine. No. And, I, and I think that's important for people to, to understand. It's like, you don't have to speak French. And I think the amount mm -hmm. of French that you learn while you're there is probably a, a lot better. It's probably going to be a lot more helpful than trying to learn French. Of course, it'll be more helpful if you did know French beforehand, but regardless, <laughs> um, you're going to learn it. And, and what did they say? It's like 90% of communication is nonverbal. So dancing non and stuff is, is definitely appreciated. So. Exactly. And I do want to also mention that. So last year I went to France for the first time and it was really interesting because I went to London and then we, we took the train to Paris for a day. And so every person that was of some sort of black descent, whether it was African descent or wherever, anybody that looked black and we had a conversation and I was speaking French, they were like, oh, your French is good where did you learn French? And I was like, child, you don't want to know, but they could hear the dialect because when I speak into like, let's say a white person who was French, they're like, Ooh, where did you learn your French? Cause it, it, I have like a very African esque accent when I speak French. But then when I speak to black people in France, they were like, Oh yeah, your French is beautiful. Like, Oh, you need to go back to wherever you learned that from. Cause they taught you well, like blah, blah, blah. And so it's so funny that like culturally when going to a French speaking country, they were like, Oh, your French is good. When meanwhile, I'm like, Ooh, my French is, Ooh, it, it's, it's a little all over the place, but still like you can get to where I'm going to if, if you don't get it. But for the most part, everybody who was black in France was like, oh my gosh, you're like my sister. And it was just so funny. But it was, it's like when you try and you travel and you try to speak the language that is there instead of coming in with our westernized thought of like, we're the best and like everyone needs to speak English, it really humbles you. And it also gives you that reverse culture, cultural humility of like, now you understand what it's like for somebody who comes to the U.S. and doesn't have English as their first language. And there's several immigrant populations. I mean, America is a melting pot within itself, which is, which is a beautiful thing, but a lot of people don't appreciate it unless they go and travel and go to a country where English is not the first language and people are shocked 
when it's like, oh my God, everyone doesn't speak English here. It's like, no. <laughs> right. That, that's very, very, very important. And, yeah. And there's a lot of dialects in, in languages. Like even if you think like in the US, there's like the southern, the southern, southern eastern US black, how how they talk, yeah. <laughs> how they speak yeah. English. Like yes. and, and it's funny because my, my partner is uh Vietnamese. Her mom is from Vietnam originally. And wow. she she would say a lot of like uh what what's happening, man? And like just like in, like, in like not not a way that you think is like formal, but it works because it works, you know. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. Right. Okay. So your next position was as a as a public health analyst as a Sims coordinator at the Health Resources and Services Administration, and you did this program. You, I, I believe you started it and then you got into your MPH program and then you did it for like a little bit of the beginning of your MPH program. If that's how I read your LinkedIn profile as, so I, I could be completely wrong there, but tell us about that position and then like applying for your master's of public health where you got your master's of public health at Emory University, mm-hmm. just people listening. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I was still in the Peace Corps, I knew that the Peace Corps is only for two years. And so my fir- at the end of my first year, I was like, okay, I need to start applying to schools, which means I needed to retake my GRE. So they didn't offer the GRE in, Ghana, uh, in Togo, but they did offer it in Ghana, which is right next door. So I planned like this whole trip and went to Ghana to take my GRE, um, which is like a whole nother experience of like, woo. Uh, but took the GRE in Ghana, came back to Togo, everything ended up happening. I ended up leaving. And so, but because I was in the Peace Corps at the time, I got all these waivers. So I was able to apply to multiple schools with these waivers. So there wasn't the economic burden, which I think is one of the great things about Peace Corps. It does allow you to do several different things that you wouldn't get the opportunity to do if you were applying just straight out of undergrad or straight after, you know, a work experience in the U.S. Uh, So because of the Peace Corps, you can also get the same waivers if you work for AmeriCorps. Um, So if there is anyone listening out there that's interested in, you know, doing public service, definitely look into AmeriCorps as well as Peace Corps, because both of those are great avenues to be able to have work experience, but also get some of those non-competitive eligibilities to be able to apply to federal government positions, but also get waivers. So if you're interested in going to graduate school, you're not paying all those application fees because that little $75 can add up if you're applying to, you know, five or six schools and you want to cast your net wide in terms of how many schools you apply for. And at the same time, you also have to pay for each time you send your GRE scores to a school. So the economic, you know, impacts on a student who barely has any money to begin with and student loans, it's like, oh, let me ask you for more money that you don't have. So consider those options as you're exploring, you know, job opportunities and school opportunities um, after undergrad. So going back to just this experience of taking um, my GREs, um, I took my GRE, got into several schools and left the Peace Corps, started at uh, at the Human uh, Health Resources and Services Administration in the HIV AIDS Bureau. So I was doing HIV work, but I got to travel. I had a diplomatic passport. I got to go to Botswana. I got to go to South Africa. So I was doing like the dream in terms of like where I was with Peace Corps and where I was able to go because I was working at the federal level and I got to meet so many individuals. We got to do basically was like a a form of like an audit kind of on the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief or PEPFAR programs that were in sub-Saharan Africa. And so we got to go to multiple different countries and meet with hospital administrators and community-based organizations that all got the funding through this mechanism and got to see their you know, their sites and talk to patients and talk to the staff. And it was just, it was a beautiful experience. But as I was going through that experience, I realized one, I wasn't getting paid a lot because I was just out of the Peace Corps. So any little funky money that they gave me, I was happy with because I was making no money in the Peace Corps, but that's okay because you don't do Peace Corps because you want to make money. You do it for the people that you meet and the lives that you impact and the lives that impact you. So just want to say that point. But when I was working at Hearst, I also learned about 
all these different folks who were I was working with had either been to med school, had gotten their doctor to doctoral degrees, or had a master's. And so I was like, here, here comes this master's thing again. And like, I thought I got out of it when I left Spelman and didn't go. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, it's not in the cars, but I can still, I can still thrive. And then I was like, all these barriers of like, oh, well, you can't get paid more unless you have a master's or you have to be here for seven years and then you can get paid more. So then I was like, the math ain't mathin'. And Marissa was like, oh no. So I looked at all the schools I got into. I said, you know what? I haven't been to Atlanta in a few years. You know, I've moved home. Uh, left Spelman, went overseas, came back, did all this traveling. I said, I'm going back to Atlanta. So I chose Emory. They had a wonderful program. Specifically, I did the global health program. So that caters to returned Peace Corps volunteers. And so I did get a scholarship to go to Emory, which was, you know, a blessing because Emory is expensive. They are also, I think, the number four school of public health right now in the U.S. So they are ranked as well and usually have been within the top 10 and the top five within the past couple of years. So a great, great school. And going into my global health program, I do have to say that I was somewhat of a unicorn because most of the folks in the global health program were international students and or were not black. So I was the only, I think, American born uh, black person in the global health program, which I think is also an issue, but we'll get into that later, um, within diversity within the global health field, because a lot of... Uh, white people will go into, you know, the field of global work and um, they occupy that space. And that's not to say that they're not great at it or that they're not doing uh, good for the good of the community. But a lot of, you know, folks do Peace Corps, but they do not look like you and I. And that is a problem. And I did experience reverse kind of culture shock when I went to Togo because um, you know, I have natural hair, I have all these different things. And so I'm thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to go back to my roots and blah, blah, blah. They were like, why don't you have a perm? Why does your hair look like Beyonce's? Why does it? And so like all of these different things we're having to unpack because their perception of me and what I should be and what I should look like is so different from what their perception was of what's on the in social media. And the same can be said about what we might think about other developing countries and nations is that, oh, like they, they don't have all these resources. Like some of them don't know how to bathe and some of the, like all these different stereotypes and stigmas that are so false. And so I really debunked some of that with my experience, but back to um, my global experience at Emory, it was great. I also got a Certificate in Social Contextual Determinants of Health. And it's so funny because it's like everybody knows about social determinants of health now. 10 years ago, five years ago, nobody was talking about social determinants of health. But since we started framing public health around health equity, social and structural determinants of health, a lot more people know about it and are making sure that like wraparound services or addressing systematic changes is a part of the conversation. So all of that training mixed with my Peace Corps experience and mixed with some of the research experiences I had at Spelman and after Spelman really helped me to be successful at Emory. And there are some great staff and faculty at Emory doing amazing work. They get a lot of R01 grants. So they have a lot of different funding opportunities uh, to do research, but also to be funded at the school. They actually opened a brand new building on Emory's campus uh, for the School of Public Health because they are expanding. They are, there are so many people that are interested in public health. And so it's a beautiful thing to have more practitioners want to join the craft. And really there was glass ceilings, which is why I had to go get my master's. Yeah, and I, I hear that a lot of times. And, and I, I think that's important for people to understand that like looking at like what you want your career to be in public health is look and see what those people in those types of positions that you're thinking about right now, do they have a master's? Like then interview them and ask them like, did you need a master's for this position? And just like understanding those kind of thought process. And a lot of the times the case is yes, which mm -hmm. is could be an issue in, in and of itself, but it's not, not for this kind of conversation here, especially right, as, as right, you think about right. like public health, community health. But yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you shared that. Uh, 
and during your master's program at Emory, you you had two positions, at least two positions that I have written down here as a public health informatics graduate research assistant, DGHT at CDC, and then a programs intern at the CDC Foundation. Do you want to talk a little bit about those positions? Sure. So uh, through Emory's program, you have the opportunity to do internships while, and they highly encourage most of their students to do internships because again, you want to get that real life work experience to help kind of add to your resume and your CV and your expertise so that when you graduate, you may have some networks and some resources to be able to go full time to some of these positions and, or, you know, tap their networks and see where you can go within those same fields. So there's an opportunity at Emory specifically called the Rollins Earn and Learn. It's called a real internship. And you basically can reach out to all these different organizations, both community, federal, state, local uh, opportunities, also private companies to actually intern with them. And so the mechanism is like they pay six dollars and then the organization pays you six dollars and then that makes the twelve dollars an hour so it's basically a commitment to pay half of the requirements for the students and then the university will meet that organization with the other half and then it gives students the opportunity to learn and, and experience uh, real life experiences uh, in public health so i worked at cdc and honestly, that was the end all be all for me. I said, I'm moving to Atlanta. I'm going to work at CDC and that's going to be it. But then I was like, you know what? I don't know that I'm going to be at CDC forever. I work with them now uh, all the time and I love all of my colleagues from CDC, but I wanted to do a little bit more. And so that's when I transitioned from CDC to CDC Foundation. And it was there that I actually worked on my thesis and I was working with high school students in a program that was actually funded through the Division of Adolescent School Health at CDC. Um, and helped me to be able to look at, you know, the incidence of HIV in these three communities um, and talk to high schoolers that were impacted, not directly living with HIV, but were living in amongst these community members and figuring out how can we get more education to these high schoolers in a way that is not going to be stigmatizing and it's going to reach the populations that need it, as well as bolster the health education space, all while navigating politics and all while navigating the Bible Belt and all while navigating some of those stigmas and uh, lack of conversations that are happening at this, at this level. Um, and so that was a wonderful experience because again, it put the application from my master's into practice and it really helped me to do research and community work and make sure that my master's is really making a difference with the the real application learning. So it also helped because I also got a thesis out of it. So shout out to CDC Foundation and that experience in the CDC Division of Adolescent School Health. Uh, but again, it was like a uh, it took a village. So it took my mentor, uh, Dr. Sophia Husson, who was my chair at Emory University, and also some colleagues at CDC Foundation and CDC to kind of make it all happen for me. But it's those sorts of experiences that you, are very unique to Emory. And I don't, I'm not sure if you can get that at other institutions because they don't have CDC right next door. So if CDC is one of your goals of employers or Deloitte or some of these other larger places uh, that you know, recruit for public health students, um, Emory is a great choice. And it, it has bolstered a lot of the opportunities I've had. And I still go and guest lecture there. I, I still use the services in the career development office. They also have free resources online for folks that need help with CV writing, resumes, how to negotiate a salary, like some of these things that you have to pay for. Some of these schools will have it for free online. So Definitely encourage some of the audience members if you're interested in, in trying to bolster your CV, your resume, cover letters, negotiating your salary, please go to Emory's uh, University's website, specifically the School of Public Health Career Development Office, and they have tons of, of resources. I also want to plug the Public Health Emory em Employee Connection website which is a great resource that is funded by the Rollins School of Public Health and is a job board for all folks 
that are looking into the field of public health. You can query it by job requirements. You can query it by states, where it is, how much is the salary, what, uh, there's so many different fields that you can query. So that is a great resource as well if folks don't know about that one. Yep. And they will be linked in the show notes. So definitely go and check those show notes out uh, if you're, if you're looking for those resources and can't find them online. And I definitely believe that Emory has like that, that is the most robust job search platform that I've seen from a university, um, yes. which, which says a lot. Um, but yeah. And were there any like big takeaways from the MPH program that you wanted to share with the listeners? Uh, big takeaways. Network, 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 network try to really bolster those professional contacts. I say, try all the different, take the courses that you think you're not going to like, take those core qualitative and quantitative skills courses for research design, take the biostats, take those really hard science courses. If you can, if you're interested in a certain field, infectious disease, for example, take those HIV epidemiology classes, Take the social contextual determinants of health classes. Take the different classes that might be outside of your curriculum, if you can, because it's just going to bolster your knowledge and how you can really impact the public health field. And last but certainly not least, make sure you have good time management and make sure you take care of you because we in the public health field take care of everybody else, but we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves. So make sure you're taking time for your mental health, whether that's no screen time, you know, getting outdoors, you know, cooking, hobbies, hanging out with friends, whatever that looks like for you, but make sure you also do that, that work-life balance and school life balance, because that is important. Yeah. And you got your doctor of public health after this in epidemiology at Morgan State University. Woo! So talk about that thought process and, and what you got from that DRPH program. Yes. Yeah, so, so while I was at Emory, I knew I wanted to get my doctorate and I knew I didn't want to get a PhD. And for those of you who are also in a master's program right now and are considering going into the doctoral field, definitely consider the doctorate of public health. It's a leadership degree and it's practice-based and you really can do a lot with the doctorate of public health. It's not as much research as it is with the PhD and usually you are working full-time as you're doing the DRPH. Most PhD students might have an internship or TA or will work on whatever research project that they're working on as a co-PI or the PI. But for the most part, the PhD, you are really only a student and you're not really, and you, you are encouraged to work at the same time, but it's not a requirement. But for most DRPH programs, you do already have to have a full-time job and it is for a working professional. So you will have nighttime classes or evening classes, and it really does cater to folks that are working full-time. And I knew if I stopped, I wasn't going to go. So I was just like, let's be honest, Marissa. <laughs> like we had to have a heart to heart, like a self, like look in the mirror moment. Are, are we going to do this? Okay. We're not stopping. And I, I'm really glad that I didn't stop. And I did go, I did, I was in school during the pandemic uh, at the start. So everything was in person and then everything went virtual. And I don't think my school specifically had the uh, the flexibilities as other big institutions that had a lot of funding and infrastructure to go online. So there was a lot of, you know, kinks that we had to work out in the first couple of months, because I think most of us thought, oh yeah, we're going to go to spring break and then we'll be back. So like, yeah, you can go home right now for the stay at home order, but you're going to be back in two weeks. So don't get comfortable. And then it ended up being the next two years. So <laughs> I think there was a lot of things that just kind of hit us, uh, took us by storm, but you know, that's life. And we, we definitely had to make some adjustments, but I think the burnout and a lot of just like screen you know, being on Zoom and being virtual, just there was so much Zoom fatigue. And I didn't even know what Zoom was before the pandemic. So like, I feel like everybody knows what Zoom is now. I think most of us use like WebEx or like Skype or FaceTime or other platforms or Google Meet. But uh, be that as it may, it was a great experience. Uh, Morgan State is a great school. Um, the faculty there are, are are really there because they love the work that they do. And HBCUs really need to get more students and funding, uh, specifically funding, because they they are our institutions that were built for us and by us. 
And so we really need to bolster that infrastructure. And I'm always a, a, a huge, huge advocate for my HBCU. So if you're considering going into a doctoral program or even a master's program, there are HBCUs out there that, that do have programs. So don't just look at PWIs. Please, please consider an HBCU as you're thinking about you, where you want to matriculate. And um, some of the cultural aspects of being at an HBCU uh, still ring true in grad school. So you can still go to homecoming. You can still, you know, be experience the student life if you choose to at the graduate level. It might be a little difficult if you're working full time, but you can still navigate that on a case by case basis. And if anybody wants to reach out to me to ask questions about any of that, or navigating that while working, I'm always happy to to chat. But I also had really great employ a really great employer who was supportive um, and supervisors that w really let me prioritize school as well as the work I was doing. And this job that I've had for the past four years, it really has impacted my level of leadership and being able to take my research and do real life application. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And as, as I said, the the link to her LinkedIn, to Marissa's LinkedIn, is going to be linked below in the podcast as well as on the show notes. So definitely click that, connect with the, and reach out if you have any questions, because that's one of the things that the podcast is. It's a way for you to network and connect with people. So I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And you were like, we spoke a little bit about your current role as an ending the HIV epidemic initiative coordinator at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And mm -hmm. as I said earlier, I'll come, I'll come back to it. You started this right before the pandemic. I think it's November of 2019. So like a couple months before the pandemic started. Talk about like how the role shifted, like from those first couple of months then into the pandemic and, and maybe like how it, how it is now, if, if it has transformed. Mm-hmm. So when I first started, I was also going into, uh, so I, my office is in Washington, D.C. I was taking classes at Morgan State in Baltimore City. That commute was nuts <laughs> in terms of I was waking up at four. I got on the train, would get, uh, would, would wake up at like four something, go to West Baltimore. Um take the train to DC, take the Metro to my office, work eight hours then, or, or nine hours, depending on the day, then leave there, get back on the train, do all that, then get back to West Baltimore, then go, get to class by six and then be in class till nine, go home, do like whatever homework I had and try to get like five minutes of sleep to then do it again. So very unhealthy, very unhealthy uh, in terms of what I was doing to try and make the ends meet. And for those that are working full time as well as doing school, consider doing an online program because some of these programs are online now, but pre-COVID, a lot of them were, they required you to be in person because it really is a different experience when you're in the classroom with the professor and with your classmates versus being on Zoom. But now a lot of programs have gone completely virtual because we had to starting at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so in terms of you know the the, the differences between um, now and at the beginning of COVID, I, I really. I honestly thought I was crazy, um, and so did my coworkers when I would just be running rampant. And when I first started, they they understood that I was taking courses and all of that, so they really did give me some flexibilities. But some of the things I started to do at the beginning of my uh, job was do webinars. And so I was like the queen of doing webinars, both internally and externally. And so that was a really great way for me to still collaborate with people in the community, at other agencies, in other fields, in the public-private partnership world, and to bring light on several different topics that I was interested in, in the, in the field of infectious disease. And then also for EHE or any HIV epidemic initiative, we also had cross-cutting webinars that would in, involve HRSA and CDC and NIH and SAMHSA and all these other uh, IHS and all these other, other federal entities 
to also help inform the community. And so while I was doing that, I was doing coursework. And as I was doing some of my coursework, I was doing the real life application of some of these courses. So looking at like qualitative research methods, I was doing that in the field of my job of looking at, okay, what's in the, in the, in the field going, what's going on in the world of public health and infectious disease, specifically around black women, for example, and taking that data and interpreting it for my office and saying, this is what's happening in the real world right now. And in the research world, what can we do to inform policy? Because the data moves the policy, but the data can't come from the research unless there's research dollars and the research dollars come from Congress. And so there's just like all these different systems that happen for policy to change, but if the policies are there and they're not serving the community, we have to backtrack and do all these different steps to make sure that the policy is is reflecting what we want to see, you know, in the world of public health. So I say all that to say, looking back on the past four years, there's been some ups and downs, there's been some bad days, there's been some good days, and that's fine because that's normal. And I saw a presentation recently and literally someone said, your public health journey looks like this. <laughs> just like just like two chords, just like all right. jumbled together. And it's not this linear, beautiful path of like success or not success or like up and down. It's all over the place. You could have some successful days. You could have some good days. You can have some bad days. You can have some days where you're really feeling it. You can have some days that you're not. But I say all of that to say, listen, that's the beautiful thing of public health. And my position now has really opened a lot of doors for me. And it, it really has, it, having the doctorate has really helped me to be a leader in this field. And without it, I don't know that I would have had the same opportunities. And specifically in the federal government, a lot of people have a PhD or an MD and not a DRPH. So being a DRPHer makes you unique, almost like a unicorn, if you will. And it's a beautiful thing because I'm trailblazing in my own way. And so if you want to be a part of the trailblazers, come and join the DRPH coalition, because <laughs> if you're interested in learning more about the DRPH, we have a website and I'll put it in the show notes, as Omari said. But we are also a, a fairly new organization and we're trying to, you know, help those that are interested in gaining the doctorate of public health to be able to have the tools to do that. And then also connect with folks that are either already graduated or are currently in a DRPH program now to have mentorship as well as communication. We have career panels. We have all sorts of things. So definitely encourage you all to reach out. And if you're interested in learning more about the coalition, about the DRPH, about just being a black woman in public health, I'm here for all the things. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll definitely uh, link that so people can check that out. And do you want to share a couple maybe of things that you do in your day-to-day -day role or like major like roles or uh, responsibilities that you have as the initiative coordinator? Sure. So one of the main things I do is convene and collaborate folks. So a lot of times in the federal government, we work in silos. And that's what we do in the field of public health as well. We work in our silos and we work with folks that are like-minded or are working in the same field. And so with EHE, it's health equity at this focus. And so we're really trying to break down those silos and make sure that conversations are being had across all sectors and making sure that the right people are at the table. One of the themes of my work now is new partnerships and new traditions and expanding the voices of who we have at the table. And so Part of my job now is to bring new voices into the conversation around HIV and both in prevention, care, and treatment. Also, I love part of the webinar series that I do because I'm bringing in all sorts of different voices and perspectives to this conversation. I also help present and disseminate data we have something called the AHEAD dashboard, which is our data visualization tool. We have indicators, and we also work very closely with the Office of National AIDS Policy at the White House. And so uh, 
the director of that office is Director Harold Phillips. And so he was actually my supervisor when I worked at HRSA. And so it really has come full circle, the work that I used to do at HRSA, because I'm still doing very impactful work at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. And so all of these things kind of play a role into helping to end the HIV epidemic, but also occupying this seat as a Black woman is an important identity that I hold and I take up space with in my leadership role. And I encourage all my communities of color, my BIPOC, or any of my sexual and gender minority folk, if you identify, at whatever, however you identify, it's important to occupy that space and try to bring awareness and knowledge to not only your community, but also to where you work. And whatever that looks like, whether it's at the federal level, community level, grassroots level, or even in the academic space, it's important that we take heed to how we identify and how we can take our messaging to a, a greater and larger level. Before I move you on to the Furious Five, five questions to ask all guests. I'd like to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Where would I like to see myself in the future? Well, in the famous words of Issa Rae, rooting for everybody Black, always, every day, all day. Um, I always lead with that quote. I end with that quote with most of my presentations. And I really love being a Black woman and I love my community. And so any way that I can collaborate, convene, and partner with other like-minded individuals um, is, is something where I see myself going. I don't necessarily know what that looks like, where that is, if it will be where I currently am or at another capacity, but I still love the idea to make sure that Black women are at the center of almost every and anything that I do. And then also when looking at HIV, looking at those women that are currently living with HIV, but also those that may be at either at risk of acquiring HIV and making sure they have the data and the knowledge to make informed decisions like pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP um, and all of the resources that are out there so that they can protect themselves. I know we didn't get into the nerdy part of infectious disease and HIV prevention, but maybe that'll be for another podcast. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm glad you brought that up. I'll write that down and we'll, we'll figure out a way to get that, get that uh, as part of the larger conversation. Awesome. Yeah. And then moving on to the Furious Five. Uh, number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Try everything. Try everything. Explore. Push your boundaries. Try things that you wouldn't traditionally think of. Look into LinkedIn. Find your dream job and reach out to that person on LinkedIn. Or if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to folks on LinkedIn, look at their matriculation. Where did they go to school? What activities did they do? What organizations were they a part of? What leadership initiatives did they take? Um, and really figure out how you can do like-minded steps or be or taking that similar path to kind of get you to where that other person is. And maybe it is you taking a leap of faith and, you know, reaching out to that individual because they could usually, you know, use a mentor, use you could use them as a mentor or they could use you as a mentee and you can have a mutually beneficial relationship. Absolutely. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? I would say maximize on all of the networks you currently have and look at the opportunities to interact more with the federal government. And when I say that, I, I mean it in all gamuts of organizations that are in the infectious disease work. Um, and most organizations at the federal level are doing some something around HIV. So if you're interested in HIV work, start at the community level, start at the grassroots level. If that's not your jam, go into research. If that's not your jam, go into policy. But there's so many different ways that you can navigate into this, this space of ending the HIV epidemic. And we have coordinators all over the US. So definitely reach out if you're interested. Awesome. Number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? 
So I'm working on improving work-life balance. I'm always trying to balance so many different things. And I spoke about that in college. I was balancing so many things. And I think it has transpired into my adult life. But making sure I take time for myself to unwind and unplug and focus on my mental health. Because if I can't take care of me, I can't take care of all of the populations that I'm trying to serve. So always being reflexive is important for me. And also making sure that that work-life balance of like, okay, I need a vacation or, okay, I need a date night, or I just need a day for me, or I need some retail therapy, making sure that I'm doing that in tandem with Zumba and kickboxing and all the other things that I shared earlier today are really important. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Absolutely. Please take advantage of American Public Health Association. Take care, take advantage of the DRPH Coalition. Take, take advantage of professional organizations that can help you with skills. If you're interested in getting, you know, certifications, do them. Google certificates, do them. Getting a CHES, getting your MCHES, getting a CPH. If there's anything out there that you want to aspire to get, go and get it. Because the worst thing you can do is look back and say, dang, I really missed the opportunity to maximize on getting a certification or getting that experience. So I, I say go and get it. Love that. Love that. And then last but not least, where can people connect with you, Marissa? Oh, so many different places. So my email is drmarissarob at gmail.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn backslash drmarissarob. I'm also on Twitter, drmarissarob. So please, please, please reach out. Let's connect. Uh, I'm, again, I am really big on HIV prevention, care and treatment, HIV infectious disease. I'm trying to increase diversity within that field. So if you want to join me, please, please reach out. I'm happy to discuss any of my matriculation. If you're interested in public health, even if you're not interested in public health, I'm here for all of the things. And if there's any opportunities where I can help put a smile on somebody's face, connect them to some resources or make somebody's life better, I'm all for it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, you shared a lot of valuable perspectives and your story is definitely going to be something that's helpful to someone probably a lot of people out there. Thank you so much, Amari, for the opportunity and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Housekeeping items, everyone. Thanks so much for watching or listening to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not subscribed as yet. Leave a like if you're watching this one on YouTube. Leave a review, hopefully a five-star review, and share this with a friend who gets some value from the episode. Greatly appreciate you all. Peace.